recording. Right. So the next part of the brain um, is uh, collectively referred to as the midbrain. Um, but it's only the midbrain if you divide up the brain into three sections, which I think I mentioned the variable divisions before. So there's like, um, you know, there's like the cerebrum and then the midbrain and, and then the hindbrain. Um, the hindbrain is the cerebellum. The midbrain is really um, two different areas. So it's the diencephalon and then uh, the structures that we call the brain stem. So we're going to start with the diencephalon and the structures within it, and then we'll move on to the brainstem. But um, just so that you're aware that sometimes they get uh, grouped together as a single part, okay? But I, I think it makes more sense as two. So diencephalon is um, basically the, the, the deepest, uh, most central part of the forebrain. So it's going to be deep to like the basal nuclei and white matter of the cerebellum. And um, we can basically divide up the diencephalon into three paired structures. So when we say paired, of course, we're referring to the fact that there's gonna be matching right and left halves, okay? So they're symmetrical structures. So thalamus, hypothalamus, and then some stuff that we collectively refer to as the epithalamus, but we'll start with the thalamus. So the thalamus is uh, basically this little like paired um, globe structure that as you can see is just deep to the cerebrum. So the thalamus is here, the corpus callosum which is the majority of the white matter collect connecting the right and left halves of the cerebral cortex is right there. So you can see that it sits just below that and do you have a question? What slide number is that? I don't know. I'm just starting where we left off. Um, it's 55 on lecture 16. So, um, thalamus is here, um, and then the corpus callosum is here, and then as you can see, the hemispheres of the cerebrum are up there. And the thalamus is kind of shaped like a squished together dumbbell. So directly on midline, there's just this little connector. And then the majority of it is just to the right and left of that. And its position is not an accident. So the thalamus is the relay station for all information coming into the cerebral cortex and going out. It literally controls everything going to the cerebral cortex. Okay, there's a couple of very small exceptions, but don't worry about it. So in order to do that, there is a bunch of gray matter in there. So it's mostly just a bunch of nuclei with a variety of special functions that we're not gonna worry about. We don't have time for that. Um, and um, a lot of it is about processing the sensory information coming from the rest of the body before it goes to the cerebral cortex. So all of the sensory neurons that are sending information from the rest of the body actually synapse in the thalamus and then another neuron goes up to the cerebral cortex to the corresponding sensory area, right? So I showed you there were different sensory areas for different senses. So the thalamus is what determines where they go. And what that means is that there's a level of processing that occurs between the sensory information um, simulating our sensory receptors and actually getting up to the part of our brain that's capable of making us aware of it. So the thalamus is super important in that it has this integral um, function basically as a gatekeeper um, or like the you know best personal assistant to the cerebral cortex. So this is sort of the, the 3D representation. So like I said, it's like, however you want to think about that, two little oblongs squished together. There's just a single connector between the right and left halves. Um, and generally speaking, the, you know, the left half corresponds to the left 
cerebral hemisphere and the right half corresponds to the right. And all of these different words in here um, are the various nuclei that have different jobs. And that's the part we're not gonna worry about. All right, so that's the thalamus. Very important role, mostly to do with the cerebral cortex. The hypothalamus is a collection of nuclei that is inferior to it, which is why it's called that. So hypo just means below. This is structures that are physically below the thalamus. But its job is completely different and yet arguably even more important. So the hypothalamus is the visceral control center. The hypothalamus is the major link between um, all other brain functions and the autonomic or visceral nervous system, which we'll talk about later. And also it's the major link between the nervous system and the endocrine system, which is all the hormonal control of homeostasis over the body. So in a lot of ways, this is the critical link for all homeostatic control for the whole body. So it makes it pretty important. And yet it doesn't really have a very discreet um, structure in the brain. So when we look at a brain under dissection, we're kind of just like, well, here's the little thing that connects the right and left halves of the, the thalamus. So the, the hypothalamus is right here. That's how we locate it. It's also directly connected to the pituitary gland, which is an endocrine structure within the skull. And that's the other way we know where the hypothalamus is, because if we see the pituitary, we know the hypothalamus is right there connected by this little stalk. So you'll learn more about the hypothalamus um, first when we talk about the autonomic nervous system. And then when you learn about the endocrine system, you're actually gonna learn a lot more about the hypothalamic functions because even though it's part of the nervous system, its functions are far more understandable in terms of the endocrine system. So kind of a big deal. So here's some functions. So for example, you can basically think about it as controlling the autonomic nervous system, including initiating physical responses to emotions. Um, so it's connected to the parts of the brain that have emotions, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, and it's the reason why like, when we get embarrassed, we flush, or when we're nervous, our heart races and we sweat, or when we're angry, the same things happen, or when we're happy, you know, the, the way that we respond physically to our emotions is gonna be via the hypothalamus. It also contains the um, thermal regulatory control center, so the thermal regulation that we've talked about before, like um, as far as negative feedback, like this is where that's integrated. It contains a lot of the, um, oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, contains some of the stuff that helps us regulate how much we eat. So it kind of monitors energy balance in the body. Um, it monitors the uh, concentration of ions in our blood. And so it helps regulate water balance. And when we feel thirsty, it's because the hypothalamus says we are. Um, it's also part of monitoring our circadian rhythm, not entirely, but some, so sleep and wake cycles, and nice, I love it when I find a typo that I've never fixed before, and like I said, it has a major, major role in controlling endocrine system function. So, um, yeah, one of the more critical structures in the brain there. And the last part of the diencephalon is the epithalamus. So the epithalamus is um, another uh, collection of nuclei. Um, and I'll show you a picture, but it's a little bit inferior to, no, no, posterior to the thalamus. Um, and we don't, we're not gonna get into a lot of the details of it, but the, the one we like to sort of point out is the pineal gland. So the pineal gland or the pineal body is an endocrine structure within the brain. And its job is to secrete melatonin um, when your eyes don't register light, if that makes sense. There's another type of, cool. So basically it lets your body know when it's daytime and when it's nighttime, which is how we have a circadian rhythm. We have different ebbs and flows of energy and 
um, you know, sleepiness levels and stuff like that um, based on day and night rhythms. And this is because when it's nighttime, your pineal gland secretes melatonin. When it's daytime, it doesn't. And that's how your body knows how long the day is. And that corresponds to the time of the year. And this is also the reason why we get screwed up when we do a lot of traveling. Um, because if you've traveled, you know, from one coast to the other in the US or you've traveled halfway around the world or something, um, you screwed up this secretion pattern and your body's like, what is going on? So um, yeah, so that's the main thing there. We don't really even know all of the functions of melatonin yet. Um, there are some other things that'll probably be understood better later, but that's its major one. There are other structures in the epithalamus. Um, you don't need to know these particular names, um, but basically things like regulating motor function and emotions. So just kind of stuff, if that makes sense. So there's not a single pattern to these structures of the epithalamus. I'm not even sure why they all get grouped together, other than the fact that they were all in the diencephalon as that uh, vesicle that we talked about from a developmental standpoint. So picture here, really hard to find a good diagram showing the epithalamus, but the pineal gland is back here. And so then this little red streak is showing you the other structures. Um, and again, they'd be running uh, bilaterally, although the pineal gland is a single structure. Um, so there is no right and left sides to it. It just is right down the middle. All right, any diencephalon questions? All right, so next part of the brain is the brain stem. And it's called the brain stem because it is the most inferior part. And if you think about, you know, the brain kind of like a flower or some other plant type thing, and like the cerebral cortex was the actual flower, then the spinal cord and the brain stem are the parts that hold the flower up. So that's kind of where that comes from, or at least that's how I remember it, because I might have made that part up. I'm not sure. There's three parts to the brain stem. They all have overlapping um, but separate functions. But overall, their functions are to control the autonomic, um, not autonomic, sorry automatic behaviors necessary for survival. As in, this is where we know whether or not we're breathing and um, like staying conscious and regulating our heart rate and our blood pressure and all of that stuff. This is also where most of the nuclei, so the gray matter associated with cranial nerves is located. So when we talk later about cranial nerves, which is all the nerves that control all the functions in our face, um, this is where they originate or, yeah, come back to, whether they're sensory or motor. So we'll go through one at a time, starting with the midbrain because it's the most superior. So this is basically all the brainstem stuff. So you can see again, um, cerebral cortex is up here. Here's that corpus callosum. Um, here's that, it's called the interthalamic adhesion. So this is the thalamus we can see on midline. Um, the hypothalamus is right here, and epithalamus is here, little pituitary glands here. So this is most of the rest of the brain, other than the cerebellum, which we'll, we'll get to. Oh, actually the cerebellum is like here and they didn't put it in. But anyway, so we'll start with the midbrain and work our way down. So the midbrain, now you've noticed, is both a region in the brain um, proper, so forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain, but also it's one of the parts of the brain stem. So they refer to different things, and um, like I said, I don't really like that midbrain split as far as the three parts because I prefer to keep it separate as diencephalon and brain stem. So for the most part, when I say midbrain, I'm going to mean this one, as in this superior portion of the brain stem. But keep in mind that it does have those two separate meanings. And this brainstem, or 
this midbrain is actually part of the other one, right? Because we talk about overall midbrain, we're talking about the diencephalon as well as the brain stem itself. And the midbrain within that is right here, okay? So the midbrain um, has nuclei that are related to a lot of reflexive actions. So for example, reflexes involving um, visual and auditory information. So things like when you hear a noise, you can automatically turn your head towards it. That's that kind of reflex. Um, there's also um, nuclei related to cardiovascular and respiratory systems, as well as centers for certain cranial nerves. So the midbrain contains parts of all of the major brainstem functions. Um, this is a cross section of it, which I'm sure means nothing right now. Um, and we're not really going to learn all of these things, um, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, so again, just because I had already showed you that picture. So remember, it's, it's, it's right here in the brainstem. And now we're going to go down to the pons. Uh, so pons means bridge, okay? Um, so even though it sounds like a weird name, it means bridge because the pons is like the major pathway for all the axons, all the white matter connecting the spinal cord and the rest of the brain. Um, which is kind of weird because like that shows the medulla, but that's okay. So again, we have a lot of automatic function nuclei. So the um, major respiratory centers are in here, um, more nuclei for different cranial nerves, and portions of what's called the reticular formation, which um, we'll talk about hopefully later. I can't remember where I put it, but um, the reticular formation is basically um, a bunch of scattered things throughout the brainstem that are crucial for consciousness. So basically, um, control like your state of awakeness and arousal. Um, so yeah, so then the bridge part is that there's a lot of axons running through here to higher brain centers. Um, and especially there's a lot of connections to the cerebellum, which is the part of the brain we haven't talked about yet, um, but we'll cover that um, in just a few slides. So the midbrain's up here, okay? So then here's the pons. It's notable because it kind of sticks out a lot in, in the um, anterior inferior direction. Um, and uh, here's the cerebellum. So it's got some big connections up here and it's got some big connections up through the thalamus to the cerebrum. And that takes us to the last part of the brain from a superior inferior standpoint, which is the medulla oblongata. Um, and you're welcome to just say medulla. There is no other medulla to my awareness, um, but the proper name is medulla oblongata. Um, referring to its shape because something's oblong is kind of like a big thing. Um, so there is, um, there's no like obvious distinction where the medulla ends and the spinal cord begins, but basically as the, the nervous system structures pass from inside the skull, out the skull at the foramen magnum, we know that medulla stops and spinal cord starts. So um, very similar functions to the pons. The pons and the medulla do a lot of the same things, including having good connections to the cerebrum and the cerebellum, because of course, literally everything between the spinal cord and the brain has to pass through the medulla, because that's the only, it's the only thing coming out of the frame and magnum. Um, there are nuclei for other cranial nerves in here too. And then um, additional nuclei for the cardiovascular and respiratory centers. So the medulla and the pons both contain these major centers for super important automatic um, functions of breathing and controlling heart rate and blood pressure. And you'll learn more about that um, from the cardiovascular and respiratory standpoint when you get to those systems. <clears throat> 
So again, here's the pons, and then this is uh, the medulla oblongata, and then um, the spinal cord starts about here. And all of these little guys sticking out, these are the cranial nerves that we will learn about soonish. Um, and those are all, as I said, going to and from the face uh, for control um, of, of, of your face. So um, a little bit more on those automatic functions and autonomic functions, some of which overlap. Um, so cardiovascular center of the medulla um, can um, adjust uh, how hard and how fast the heart is pumping as well as regulating blood pressure. And then the respiratory center in the medulla is actually the one that regulates the breathing rhythm. So literally when we're not thinking about breathing and we're just breathing, it's coming from the medulla. Um, and then also controls the rate and the depth. Now again, there are control centers in the pons too and they all do work together. But we know that a lot of other reflexive activities, especially to do with, um, especially to do with breathing, um, are also located here. So sneezing, coughing, swallowing, um, in part, is located here. Um, I'm still a little confused about the hiccuping thing um, because it serves no purpose. But apparently, when you have damage to a portion of the medulla, you hiccup without stopping. So we know there's something related to it in there. But I think it basically just comes back to this whole ability to regulate the diaphragm, which is how you control breathing um, and sneezing and coughing as well. And then there's a vomiting center in there too. So a lot of different things that we do without control um, are going to be down here. And um, this is also why um, you know, you can have a lot of brain damage in higher levels and still technically be alive because as long as you're breathing and your heart's beating, you know, your body can, can often stay alive. Um, to fix chronic hiccups. So there's a lot of different causes of hiccups um, and it depends on uh, what caused them as far as whether or not you can fix it. And probably just by, I, I just, you know, I, I don't have time to really delve into it, but I look just a little bit to be like, this always drives me crazy. I've always said it. I've never had time to look it up. And I was like, I'm going to look it up and figure this out. Why do we hiccup? Um, we don't, there's no function to hiccups. It's just a misbehaving diaphragm. Um, and so it depends on why. Um, so basically the nerve that controls it, comes out, um, you know, comes out very close to the brain stem. And then there's, like I said, diaphragm control up here. And if you irritate that nerve or the brain stem or the diaphragm itself, anywhere along that length, you can get hiccups. Um, so even things like, um, like heartburn could potentially cause it because the esophagus is really close to that nerve. Um, so you have to like figure out why, like, where along the pathway the problem is. Um, as far as I can tell from what I looked at, if it's the brainstem, like you're, you're in trouble, like there's no fixing that. Um, but usually hiccups are caused by other things. So you can actually look it up and they kind of go through the differentials for how they figure that out. All right, so that takes us to the last part of the brain, which is the cerebellum or the hind brain, called of course because you know it's the most posterior part of the brain. Um, so the cerebellum is in charge of coordinating motor output so that all movement is smooth, it's timed properly, and it's like agile instead of being horribly, horribly clumsy. And so even when people are horribly, horribly clumsy, um, it's a lot better than if their cerebellum wasn't functioning. So let's see if I can uh, get this to work. It'd be easier if I 
Do that. Show you one of these. So with the um, when we talk about what brains do, um, it's actually easier to appreciate when you see what happens when it's not working anymore. And um, with the hype, uh, with the cerebellum, um, the easiest examples to find are actually of cats, uh, because um, cats can be born with a less than functional cerebellum. Um, usually if their mom has a um, particular infection when they're pregnant with them, it can impair that development. And so the cats are born thinking they're normal um, and are otherwise normal, but their cerebellum didn't fully develop. And so it impacts their ability to uh, coordinate their movements. And so what we see is a cat who, instead of being, you know, very cat-like, is having, you know, trouble doing basic movements. And that's because one of the things that the cerebellum is really good at is that timing issue of when do I initiate this movement? Um, and then when it smooths out movements, a lot of the times what it does is it inhibits them a little bit. And so without that, you tend to have more exaggerated movements. But you can see that she's still perfectly capable of eating. It's just super awkward. And so this is a cat who is otherwise perfectly healthy. She's never going to get any worse because it's, it's, a, it's something that is fixed. Um, but you can see that they definitely have a lot of that set up so that she's got more space to aim at her food because she's not going to be able to eat out of a tiny bowl the way a lot of cats would be able to. So that's what happens when your cerebellum is not working super well. And there are like a billion of those videos online because um, they end up being... Sharing. No. Uh, adoption videos of cats. Um, and, and it can happen in other species, and I presume that it can happen in people too, but I honestly haven't tried to find people videos because that, that would just not be as fun to watch. Um, so yeah, so the cerebellum then. Um, its name just means like little cerebrum because it looks very much like a miniaturized version of the cerebral hemispheres. Um, there are right and left hemispheres, although there's a central hemisphere as well. It's called the vermis, which means vermin, like worm. And so it's kind of set up like that instead of like the cerebrum, which I realize now as I draw that, that that doesn't look like what I meant it to. But anyway, um, so yeah, and then each hemisphere, this isn't super critical, but each hemisphere is divided into three lobes um, by fissures. So just like the cerebrum has different, has, um, you know, five lobes, the uh, cerebellum has three, and then the gray and white matter are set, uh, set up the same way. So there's um, a cortex of gray matter, um, deeper paired nuclei, and then there's white matter deep to the cortex. Uh, the white matter, if you cut into the cerebellum, looks like a tree, and so they actually name it the arbor vitae, which is the tree of life. So this is some cerebellum right here, um, and this is, of course, on a sagittal section, and the arbor vitae is like this stuff. So the, um, the gyri and the sulci are very fine and thin. So it kind of makes like a leaf-like pattern if you really look at it. And this is um, like an MRI or a CT picture. And so you can see that really is what it looks like. And um, if we did dissections, we would normally do a sheep brain dissection. You'd be able to see that on there as well. And we'll see it on our, um, on our cadaver dissection, our virtual dissection as well. Here's a bigger one showing you that. This also shows you how each 
hemisphere has these three fissures um, creating three lobes. We're not going to get into that too much. We're just going to remember that there's cortex and arbor vitae. Um, and then its connections to the brain um, are related to its function. So there's three um, columns of connection and peduncle is just what we call these white matter tracks. So there's going to be right and left of each of these and there's these three sets. So the superior set connects the cerebellum um, and the midbrain to the cerebrum, uh, specifically, of course, the motor cortex. Um, and of course, that's going to be by way of the thalamus because the thalamus controls everything going to and from the cerebrum. The middle peduncles um, are between the pons and the cerebellum. Um, basically, the pons is telling the cerebellum what you've decided to do. And then the inferiors connect the medulla and the cerebellum. And that's going to be about um, your body's uh, location and position in space. So that's proprioceptors are the, um, are the receptors connected to your muscles and your joints and your tendons and stuff. Um, so that you always know exactly where you are in space and how you're positioned. And then how you're moving, if you're moving. And so that's about helping you keep your balance. So that way the cerebellum knows what your brain's deciding to do, what your brain is doing, and where your body is so that it's constantly giving feedback um, to help control that output. So these are showing you the different peduncles, so superior, middle, and inferior, connecting various areas to the cerebellum so that the cerebellum's getting all of this nice input. So when we see how the cerebellum does it, it kind of works like this in a nutshell. So whenever your cerebrum, whenever you decide to do something, so when your cerebrum is going to initiate muscle contractions, so this is voluntary muscle movements, your cerebellum gets notified. And simultaneously, it's also getting notified about where the body already is and where it's going, so what its movements are doing. And it takes those two pieces of information and it processes them. So it figures out how much muscle contraction you need to maintain your position or maintain your posture while you're moving and be smooth and coordinated while your muscles contract. And it's doing this on a moment to moment basis, much faster than you can be aware of. And um, it does that, like the way it actually like takes this into account and, and has control over it is that then it tells the motor cortex and the brainstem what they need to do to self-correct. So it gets all the information from the, the necessary areas. It figures out what needs to be altered to make things ideal. And then it tells them to fix their stuff. So that's the cerebellum. All right, any questions about any part of the brain? All right, so um, the last thing we'll touch on for brain is called functional brain systems. So functional brain systems are where we have a particular function that the brain does, but instead of being um, localized in a particular location or, or a structure like we've you know everything we've been talking about is here's a structure here's what it does so this is here's what the brain does and it's spread out over a bunch of areas so we call it a functional brain system because it's still a bunch of neurons working together they just don't happen to be in physical proximity and we're going to just hit the two major ones um, which are the limbic system and the reticular formation. So the reticular formation I briefly mentioned already. Um, and so now we'll get into a little bit more of what that actually means. But we'll start with the limbic system. So the limbic system is how we feel and process emotions. Okay, I wanna start with that. So we call it the emotional brain or the emotional system of the brain. <clears throat> 
and it involves a bunch of structures in the superior part of the brainstem and um, kind of like midbrain and like deep cerebrum. So basically, um, emotional responses we have to thoughts, situations, dreams, everything, any emotional response that we have, um, how we express those emotions or not express those emotions, and then how we resolve mental conflict when frustrated. So how we work through those emotions all get processed by the limbic system. And um, the really interesting thing about the limbic system is that it originated as the, as the part of the brain that, um, that processed smells. So it just started as your nose brain. And somehow that morphed into emotion. Um, and so uh, your ability to smell tends to go straight through to the limbic system in an unprocessed way, which is why odors um, can trigger really strong emotional um, and memory-based responses um, because there's this direct connection there. Um, and then uh, for some reason, memories can also trigger really strong emotional responses because there's also some overlap in, in where memory stuff is stored. So not only is the limbic system itself kind of spread out through different regions of the brain, but it's also connected to a lot of different brain regions um, so that there's always this overlap between sensory input and emotional response. So we have a lot of, so that we're able to respond to environmental stimuli with emotion. Um, it's also connected to the rational part of our brain. So the prefrontal lobe is basically the most anterior part of your frontal lobe. And it's, um, you may recall, we talked about the frontal lobe being like where, you know, like all your like really, you know, um, higher level thinking occurs. And so there's a connection between that higher level thinking and the emotional responses. And so that lets us both um, have emotional reactions to things that we know intellectually and also intellectually be aware of our emotional responses. Um, it's also why we can have both um, emotions overriding our logic, you know, so like when we like lose control of our emotions over something, that's because your limbic system is, is taking control, not taking control of, but overriding your prefrontal lobe, but also why a lot of the time, um, especially with practice, we can stop um, our limbic system from taking control when we know it's not an appropriate time. So there's this very strong link between rational thought and emotional thought. So these are kind of all the different structures and the interesting thing is that they all kind of just like run parallel with the, the corpus callosum. So here's the corpus callosum. It is not part of the limbic system necessarily, um, but the hippocampus is this kind of crazy looking guy. Um, the amygdala is a major part of the limbic system. Um, this guy is called the cingulate gyrus. Um, and then parts of the hypothalamus are also involved in this. So it's all this kind of stuff that just kind of runs in these little, in this little arc to the left and the right um, of, of the, the, like the thalamus and stuff. Okay, so all that's considered your limbic system. The other big functional system that we have is the reticular formation. So the reticular formation runs through the brainstem so this is mostly through the midbrain and the pond and the medulla. And it runs in three columns of nuclei. And you do not need to know what they're called or anything like that, okay? This is just to kind of help you picture it. So um, basically there's one running down the middle. Um, and then um, it's uh, whatever. I should stop trying to just draw these things. Anyway, um, so the big thing that the reticular formation does is that it governs the arousal of the brain. So literally controls your level of consciousness. And the, um, the output part of the reticular formation is called the reticular activating system. 
and it's in charge of keeping you conscious and excitable. So able to respond to stimuli. So excitable the same way we talk about muscle and nervous uh, neurons. Um, and it does that by filtering sensory input to keep you aware of your surroundings and inhibiting your sleep centers which means the damage to your reticular activating system could put you in a coma because it's no longer inhibiting your sleep centers. Don't ask me questions about that. I don't know any more about it than that. Um, and then um, it also has some involvement in motor functions, especially the visceral motor functions, which means control over like smooth muscle and glands and stuff, and then coarse limb movement, as opposed to like the fine, the fine stuff. So coarse limb movement is more like, you know, like, walking and holding yourself upright and stuff like that. Picture, picture. Okay, so this is showing you three columns and then it's showing you how the reticular activating system then has all of these connections to your diencephalon and your cerebrum because otherwise it wouldn't be able to do what it does. So also a really big deal and because it's spread throughout a bunch of different places, it's not, it's not a, a, a structural system, it's a functional one, okay? So that's really all of the big stuff um, as far as what the brain does based on its anatomy. And then, of course, there's a lot of higher mental functions. Most of this stuff is gonna occur in the cerebral cortex. Um, and I'm just going to touch on them. You don't need to know too much more than like their definitions and stuff. Okay. Um, so like language, for example, actually uses pretty much all of the association areas in, um, in the left hemisphere of most people. We're talking like 90, 90%, about 10% of people use the other side. Um, it doesn't really matter which side you use. Um, so these are kind of those areas where we see lateralization of function because we just don't need, uh, let's see, we don't need a right and left area for these things because they, they, they don't correspond to the right and left sides. So again, you don't need to know the names of any of these. Just know that these are different areas to do with different parts of language. And the interesting thing is that even though the language centers are on the left usually, the right-sided areas are involved in body language. So usually those same corresponding areas are involved in understanding the nonverbal components of language. So they're still involved in language, it's just different parts of it, okay? So I think that one's the part that, you, that gets left off a lot of the times and we're just like, oh, well, this side of my brain deals with language and you're like, okay, yes, the like understanding of spoken language and I think written language and stuff, but the right side's dealing with like your ability to like look at a person and know what they're thinking or feeling, you know? So that's kind of a big deal. Um, memory, memory is super interesting. Um, we define it as the storage and retrieval of information there are different types of memory and how they get divided up depends on which textbook you read. So don't put this in stone or anything, okay? Because I've seen it talked about a lot of different ways. Um, but these are, these are pretty good categories. So like declarative memory is what we call remembering facts. And that can include um, facts about your own life as well as things that you would like learn in school or something. Procedural memory is learning skills, um, and it ties in pretty closely with motor or muscle memory. So those are separate things, um, and that's why, you know, you might not be able to remember how you learned something, but you can still remember how to do it, right? Um, and so that's why we consider them separate, because even if you learned stuff as a declarative thing first, once you actually know how to do it, it, it gets filed away separately. And then of course there's emotional memory where, um, which uh, also has a lot of overlap here, um, you know, which of course is limbic system related. So uh, I, I put this stuff in, not because we really have time for it, but because I think it's helpful um, in that 
you know, I mean, what are we doing right now? We're trying to remember things, right? So I just think it's helpful because it's pretty relevant. So we know that there are differences between our short-term memory and our long-term memory within our declarative or ability to remember facts. Um, so the short-term or working memory is a lot more limited um, because this is based on like immediate survival situations. It's not necessarily stuff you need to remember in the long term. It's just stuff that you need to remember right now. Um, and we know that very little of what enters the short-term memory actually gets held. So 5% of our input. And so that means that we're filtering out a lot of stuff that's going on in our, in our surroundings at any given time. And if you blindfolded us and asked us something, we wouldn't necessarily know it if that makes sense. So like if you walked into a room that you've never been in before and you looked around and you're like, okay, cool. And then somebody was like, all right, close your eyes. Tell me what's behind you. Um, you know, you're probably not going to remember very much of it. You feel like you knew it, but you really don't because it's just not actually that important. Um, now there are definitely studies about how this limit of like seven to eight chunks can be expanded with training. So some of that, you know, learn to remember things more stuff is valid, um, but that typically seems to be our default um, without practice. Um, now, the long-term memory has no known storage limit, so how much we can remember long-term, as far as we know, doesn't really have a, a limit, but it doesn't mean that it lasts forever, so you can definitely forget stuff. I know we all know that, um, especially if you're not using it. And that's because neurons that get ignored don't, um, don't work as hard, if that makes sense. So it's, it's really harder to stimulate them. Um, we do know that memory ability does decline with age, although there's, of course, a lot of factors involved with that. So it's not like it's a set thing. Um, and um, we know that it's easier to fit new stuff into things that have already happened before. So memory consolidation is where you kind of group things together. Um, so um, if you want to fit new memories into previously stored categories, then um, that's going to work better than having to create whole new ones. Now there's a ton more to this and we don't have time to get into it and it could probably be its own course and all that stuff. Um, so this is just going to kind of give you a teaser. Um, and you can definitely look some of this stuff up if you want to learn more about it. Um, so this is meant to be like a little flow of how this works um, as far as like how much you remember. Um, there are a lot of factors that influence whether or not things transfer from your short-term memory to your long-term memory. Um, and uh, yeah, so again, we don't really have time to get into a lot of this, but if you feel like you're struggling to remember things, it's a good subject to read up on and learn more about. Um, okay, um, a couple more little things. So brain waves, um, again, something we're not gonna get into a ton, but you know, probably kind of heard about them before and um, oops sorry and uh, basically the very most superficial parts of your brain's electrical activity can be measured by putting electrodes on the outside of your skull now keep in mind this is just the very outside it doesn't count for anything else so basically the only thing that we can measure is the activity of the cerebral cortex because that's the superficial most um, gray matter. Um, doing this uh, and studying it, we have um, four different patterns of electrical activity that are associated with different mental states. And um, again, things that we don't have time to get into, but we'll just, we're just going to hit this in a very superficial manner. So um, alpha waves are so, ah, you know what, it's fine. This does the same thing. So Alpha waves are associated with um, relaxed awakeness. So this is like when you're spacing out or almost like half asleep or something like that. These are beta waves. This is what we associate with people that hopefully all of us, this is what we have right now, okay? Um, awake alertness, 
you can see they look very similar, right? Um, theta waves are kind of weird, so they're normal in children concerning in adults. And then delta waves are what we associate with being asleep. So those are kind of considered the general classes of this. And again, I'm sure there's a lot more to it. And, you know, we do make those crazy meshes so you can get a lot of detail about exactly where you're seeing what. Um, but that's as far as we're going to go. All right. So then consciousness, again, we'll just touch on a little bit. So we talked about the reticular um, the reticular uh, activating system and its ability to, you know, stimulate consciousness and stuff. Um, there are, there are um, different levels of consciousness and it's a difficult thing to define. Um, but when it comes to like medical definitions and stuff, we try to um, distinguish between when somebody is like alert and responsive um, if they're drowsy, then they, they're typically, you know, like they'll still respond, but in a delayed fashion, um, asleep as opposed to being in a stupor, like this is, you can rouse them with a normal level of what it takes to wake somebody up versus this takes a lot. And when you're comatose, you cannot be roused. So you're staying unconscious regardless of the stimulation being used to try to wake you up. And of course, the reasons for these all vary widely. Um, but generally, when we talk about consciousness, we're, we're including a whole lot of things. So it's a very complicated topic. Um, so I just, again, something I just like to touch on to say, hey, this is all part of this, but we don't have time to get into it. Okay. So just kind of know a definition. <laughs> Um, don't really have time for this. You can read it later if you want. It's very interesting. Okay. Um, here's some more uh, resources on consciousness. If you're curious about it, again, don't really have time to get into it. Um, but very interesting, especially when you try to define what consciousness means in different species. Um, and then the other side of consciousness is sleep. So, Sleep is one of those really weird things where everybody has to do it and we're still not 100% sure why, but we know that if you don't ever sleep, then you die. Like, it's super important to do. Um, and there's, of course, uh, different types of sleep and uh, it's important that you experience all of them when you go through a sleep cycle. But basically, we um, break it up into two categories. Um, REM for rapid eye movement because that's what your eyes are doing when you're in this type of sleep. And then the, the non-REM or NREM for the rest of it. And um, these um, do corresponds to the electric, electrical, excuse me, electrical activity. So this would be the beta waves. Um, interestingly, in REM sleep, your brain waves look like you're awake. Um, you can't move because your brain actually shuts off motor control to the rest of your body, your eyes, and maybe your face are the only things that can move. And this is when your most vivid dreams occur, although you can dream in other sleep stages. Uh, the rest of it is just different levels of sleep. So Stage one is like, you're just falling asleep. Stage two is like, you've really drifted off. Three is when you actually like have your like heart rate and breathing usually slow down and you're like in more of a proper sleep. This is when you're really hard to wake up. So this is like deep sleep. Um, and this is the other times when usually we see a lot of dreams. Um, and then this really deep sleep is also when you might um, have like horrible things happen, like sleepwalking and night terrors and stuff. And half of that is probably because stage four is typically you have to hit stage four to get back up into REM. And then you kind of cycle through all of it as you go. Um, the longer you're asleep, the more these cycles spread out. And um, even though you can't move in REM sleep, you can move in these. And so that's why this is when you're most likely to sleepwalk because you're the most unconscious 
and yet there's nothing preventing you from actually moving. Super creepy. Um, but as far as I know, the whole idea that you shouldn't wake up people when they're sleepwalking is false. So if you need to wake them up, do it. Um, so yeah, so REM sleep though is, like I said, like we look like we're awake um, in that we have like alpha waves and our heart rate, respiratory rate and blood pressure increase. We have those rapid eye movements, but we don't move our bodies because our brain shuts down that ability so that we don't sleepwalk during REM dreams, which is good. It's for our own protection. But it also means that if you're accidentally awoken or even partially awoken while you're in REM, you can have this like waking paralysis thing because it can take a second for your brain to restore that function, which is why we think a lot of people have abducted by aliens um, experiences. We think it's because they wake up during this and they can't move, which is fascinating, I think. Um, okay, so here's a bunch of stuff on dreams if you're curious and sleepwalking and stuff. Um, cause again, I don't have time to get into it. Um, one of the main reasons to bring this up is because it ties back to this circadian rhythm thing. So the circadian rhythm is the 24 hour cycle that our bodies are regulated by and it's controlled by the hypothalamus. So I talked about the pineal gland and melatonin. So they are like the, they're like the sensory part of it, but then the hypothalamus is the one that actually like deals with it. Um, and in order to sleep, of course, we have to shut down the reticular activating system because when it's working, it prevents you from sleeping. Um, and then the interesting thing is that in order to reactivate it, the hypothalamus actually releases hormones to allow the reticular activating system, system to work again. So it's all really uh, complicated the way it all ties in together. And of course, our focus is going to be circadian rhythm is the 24-hour cycle, and then um, the hypothalamus actually controls it, and then melatonin is what informs that um, control. Oh, I got way too excited about this a year or so ago. All right, so read all this stuff if you're curious. Um, interestingly, everybody sleeps, and do we have any questions about that before we move on to the spinal cord? Yeah, we'll start it today at least because Jesus, so far behind now. It's okay. I want to at least get you guys started on it though. Okay. So let's just take a look at the spinal cord and then we'll get to the rest of it um, next week. Especially because I need to get you guys started on your nervous system lab stuff today too. All right, so spinal cord, the other part of the central nervous system, right? Um, and yeah, I'm just, I try, to find different ones. Okay, so the spinal cord is basically an extension of the brain. And, you know, we talked about how it all forms from that neural tube. So it all forms from the same structure, the brain and the spinal cord. And then the spinal cord doesn't have to go through a bunch of convolutions to change, right? It just gets to be a tube of nervous tissue. Um, it runs within the vertebral canal and it doesn't run through the whole thing. So um, in adults, the spinal cord usually stops at around the first or second lumbar vertebrae, which means that the other lumbar vertebrae and the sacrum and the coccyx especially are not, um, they don't contain spinal cord itself. They do contain nerves, um, but the spinal cord has stopped. And that's because it doesn't grow as much as the rest of us so when we're, when we're really young, it's filling pretty much the whole thing. And then the older we get, it doesn't grow as much as our, our vertebrae do. And so it kind of moves its way up. So the spinal cord, it's of course major job is as a road, right? It conducts all the sensory information from the peripheral nervous system up to the brain. 
and all the motor information from the brain out to the effectors. But it does have its own functions that are um, independent from the brain. So there are integration centers in the spine for actions that can be controlled at the spinal level. And a lot of that integration is reflexes. And we'll talk about reflexes next week. Um, but a lot of reflexive actions, so things like you touch something hot and you yank your hand away before you even register that it's hot, or you're at the doctor and they whack on your uh, knee and your, your leg jerks. That stuff actually occurs at the level of the spinal cord so that it's faster than if it had to go all the way up to the brain and back. And that includes things called spinal pattern generators, which um, are what let us walk without thinking about it. So when we decide to start walking somewhere, sure, that's our brain. But when we keep walking and we're doing other things and we're not thinking about our walking, that's actually just occurring at the level of the spine as it cycles through the pattern of muscle contractions and relaxations necessary for us to walk, which is kind of cool. So basic spinal cord anatomy is similar to the brain. Um, the protections are very much the same. So we have a bony layer of protection. In this case, it's our vertebrae. And then we still have the meninges, the same three layers, although in this case, the dura is just the single um, meningeal layer the, because the um, periosteal layer is just in the skull. Um, there is an epidural space separating the bone from the dura. So that's the difference there. And then the arachnoid mater is stuck to the inside of the dura. There's no subdural space either. Um, but then there's CSF um, in the subarachnoid space. The pia is stuck to the spinal cord. Um, and then there are um, extensions of the pia called denticulate ligaments that anchor the pia to the dura along the length of the spinal cord. And that kind of helps keep the spinal cord in place, even though, you know, gravity is pulling it down. Now, we divide the spinal cord into sections that correspond to our vertebral sections. But they aren't arbitrary divisions. They also correspond to physical differences in the spinal cord and functional differences in, in where they control, which hopefully I'll make that clear as we go. The spinal cord ends in a structure called the cona medullaris. So it tapers down like this. And then the phylum terminale is the last little bits. Um, of uh, meninges that kind of connect or anchor the spinal cord to the, ver the vertebrae. Um, so then because we have CSF um, in the subarachnoid space surrounding the spinal cord, um, the subarachnoid space continues beyond um, the cona medullaris and we call that the lumbar cistern. So basically there's more CSF inferior to the spinal cord. Um, by volume. And that's kind of where it circulates and then has to go back up, all the way back up to your brain to get absorbed in those um, arachnoid granulations. Uh, when we look at spinal cord, we usually look at it in the cross section. That's going to be our focus in lecture and lab because it's just the easiest way to appreciate it, but we'll look at it in longitudinal section too so that we can see it running its length. So this is a cross section. Um, through a uh, vertebrae. Now these are those intervertebral foramen where the nerves come out, okay? Um, and we're gonna go through all of this a lot more in lab, but right now what we're looking at is here's the bone, um, here's the, the space, the epidural space. It's usually filled with adipose because we don't want it to actually be a space for the spinal cord to rattle around in. So we're padding it with adipose. But when you get an epidural of any, for any reason, when they put anesthetic drugs um, into your ver vertebral canal, this is where they put it. They're not going into your spine, they're going around your spine. And then here's the dura and the, arach uh, and the arachnoid mater 
And then this is the subarachnoid space with the CSF. Um, and then this is the actual spinal cord. We'll learn the anatomy in lab. And then these are the spinal nerves, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Here it is in longitudinal section. Now this is viewing it from the posterior aspect. Okay, so this is literally, you cut the backs off of the vertebrae and looked at it. Um, right, yeah, yep, 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 okay. Um, so here we can see that these, the spinal nerve thing is happening at regular intervals, right? Because we know that we have those intervertebral foramen um, between each set of vertebrae, and there's gonna be a set of nerves coming out of each side. And we'll look at that more when we get to the nerves. So, um, I feel like I should have said this before. I don't know, I'm sure it comes up later. So um, anyway, the one different big difference between the spinal cord and the brain is that with the spinal cord, all the white matter is on the outside and the gray matter is on the inside. There's probably like on the next slide, but anyway, the gray matter is on the inside. Um, as you run the length of the spinal cord, you, you see that both at the cervical region and the lumbar region, it's wider, so we call them enlargements. Um, and that's because there's extra um, nervous tissue there um, for the extra nerves for your limbs. So the cervical enlargement is for your arms, your upper limbs, and the lumbar enlargement is for your lower limbs. Every single segment of the spinal cord that corresponds to a vertebral segment gives off a nerve. So there's 31 paired nerves. Um, we'll talk about them more in a little bit. Um, the nerves that have to come out of the, of the vertebrae beyond the level of the spinal cord, because um, like I said, it ends at like L1 or 2. Um, we call them collectively the cauda equina, which literally means horsetail, um, because it looks like a horsetail. So that's what that looks like. Okay, so here is the spinal cord, and then these are showing you the vertebrae. This is a mid-sagittal section. So the cervical enlargement is here. All these thin little lines are the nerves coming off. And then here's the thoracic. Here's the lumbar enlargement. This is the sacral segments, but you can see that we're at L1, L2. And so then all of these nerves have to keep running down the vertebral column to eventually emerge from the appropriate um, vertebral segment. Again, we'll talk about it more later. So then this part's all cauda equina. And it's pointing out the medullary cone and the phylum terminale here too, but I wrote all over that. So we'll look at that later. Um, again, um, I mentioned that when people get epidurals, they, um, they're injecting it into that epidural space of outside of the dura mater. Um, and usually where we go when we do that is actually beyond the level of the, um, the spinal cord so that we do not accidentally puncture the spinal cord. So the space between L3 and L4 is a standard um, lumbar, puncture spite, lumbar puncture site and often where we would put an epidural also to numb areas down here. Because if we wanted to collect CSF, and we don't want to risk damaging central nervous system structures, we can go right in here. Now, technically you could damage some of these nerves, but the risk is a lot lower because they can move out of the way. So this way we're relatively safe from damaging the spinal cord because it's up here. Um, yeah, so there's my fun image of the epidural anesthesia as well. You can always look at it later. You can technically have epidural anesthesia anywhere along the length, although I don't recommend it in the cervical region, depending on which parts of your body need to be anesthetized. There it is, cross-sectional anatomy. Okay, we're going to end on this, and then we'll uh, take a break, and then we'll do a little pre-lab, okay? And then we'll, we'll keep going with this lecture next week, even though we're behind. Okay, so cross-sectional anatomy of the spinal cord. Um, so there's a butterfly here because the gray matter is shaped an awful lot like a butterfly. As I said, the gray matter is central and the white matter is peripheral. 
Um, the spinal cord itself, much like the, hem the cerebral hemispheres, is partially split. So there is a median sulcus um, dorsally or posteriorly and a ventral fissure. So the midline is very much split. So even though we kind of represent it like this, there are these two lines partially dividing up the left and right sides. And then there's an itty bitty little hole right in the middle. That's the central canal. And that's the internal running of the CSF along the entire spinal cord. And then the gray matter comes out from both sides. Centrally, um, organized into what we call horns. So these are the dorsal horns. These are the ventral horns. And then um, sometimes there's lateral horns. And then um, we label the white matter as columns, dorsal. Um, no, wait, these are lateral. I have it written down on the next one. Uh, there it is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, dorsal horns. Dorsal horns are all sensory information coming in. Okay. Um, the ventral horns are all where the motor neurons live and then sending out motor information. And then um, the intermediate or lateral horns have autonomic neurons and that only occurs in like the thoracic segments. It makes the butterfly look a little weird. So here is our gray matter organization. So again, motor is down here sensory is up here, and it is divided between somatic and visceral. So it's divided between information about the musculoskeletal system and the skin versus internal organs, okay? And then um, the motor output is the same, so the autonomic or visceral stuff's here, and the somatic or skeletal muscle control is down here. And then the white matter, um, we call them columns, so dorsal, lateral, and ventral. So again, there's three. They are also organized by the direction of information. So they can be ascending to the brain, which is sensory, descending from the brain, which is motor, and then commissural fibers go across from right to left. So just like we have commissure um, between the hemispheres of the cerebrum, we have transverse tracks right to left um, in the spinal cord. Um, the truly proper name for the white matter organization is funiculi, but I think it's ridiculous, so I just call them columns, okay? So you'll see that on some of the diagrams. We're gonna stick with columns because funiculi is stupid, even if it is correct. <laughs> I feel okay saying that. Um, and then, so this is showing you the white matter organization. So again, although it does have a typo in it, I didn't make this one. Um, but so these are dorsal, lateral, and ventral. And then what this is showing you is that they are very much organized by, um, on, this, on the ascending tracks by the type of sensory information and by the descending tracks, um, well, you don't have to worry about it, but they are organized by different types of motor control. So again, you don't need to know any of this stuff. Um, this was just the picture that I picked to show you. Um, and then the other interesting thing, um, which hopefully we'll be able to see in lab, is that the patterning of the gray matter does change at different areas um, because of um, the cervical and lumbar enlargements and because of the intermediate horns in the thoracic slash lumbar areas. All right, so we'll stop it here. Um, I'm gonna take a quick five minute break and stop this recording, and then I'll take you very briefly through the nervous system anatomy that we're gonna start our next part of lab with, all right? Stop sharing. Yeah, let me stop the recording.